Good morning and welcome to worship on this Sunday, August 2nd. We are so glad to join in worship. And if you are joining from home and are connecting through Facebook, it's never been easier to invite a friend to church. So we encourage you to hit the share button. We'd also love you for you to interact in the comments of Abel. Um, when we come to the time of prayer, let us know how we can be praying for each other by listening to our prayers of joy and our prayers of concern. This week, many of our students start school and they're starting school in new ways. And so our, our prayers are with all our families as they make that transition. Um, over the past week, these school caddies have been dropped off to families um, that have preschool to all the way through high school students. If you have not received one yet, the last few are being delivered later today and so if go ahead and check your um, front porch and make and um, hopefully no, nothing's melted since it's so hot out there here at foothills we begin our time of worship by sharing a sign of peace and so i invite us to share the peace in the comments let us worship god together peace be with you me from where the thunder hides I can't outrun this heart I'm tethered to with every step I collide with you like a tidal wave crashing over me rushing in to meet me
Lord, you know how great our needs are. In these difficult times when jobs are threatened, homes are being lost, families are experiencing great stress, come and bring your healing love to us. Help us to place our trust in you. Remind us again of how you transform lives, not just with healing, but with a spirit of hope and compassion. Keep us hopeful. Teach us not to give up when things are going wrong. Give us faith that can move mountains. Give us hearts that are ready to be of service to others in all times and in all places. As we have lifted up people and situations which concern us and have asked for your hand of healing, remind us that that same healing hand rests on us also. Enable us to be people of compassion and trust, for we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.
Anna, and this week I am leading children's moment. So if you all could come and listen, this week in Compassion Camp, we learned about second chances. And this reminded me of my dogs. I got my mom from the Humane Society and I gave them a second chance to have a nice and happy family. Oh. Some pig. And a gown on a green grassy knoll lived a pleasant little pig. So it always seemed quite whole. He enjoyed his life much more than, than most because he took the time to look at things close. Wherever he was, he was always there, ready and willing to be fully aware. That Zen pig is special. It is what others would say. Yet Zen pig denied and said, I'll show you the way. Care for each other, other as much as yourself and never decide that love is true love. And when you speak to your words with care, only kindness and compassion will ease others' despair. We all make mistakes, so forgive yourself fast. Don't accept to be perfect or happiness won't last. Never waste time thinking of the future or the past. Just enjoy this moment and all that it has. Be thankful for all that you have. There is no need for more. You have everything that's needed to walk through a happy storm. When someone's in need, don't think, just act. Give all that you can and don't hold back. Listen to my words and follow the path. Then you two will sit at top the knoll with the green, green grass. This week, I want you to think about a time when you were given a second chance. How did it make you feel? Have you given anyone a second chance? among us listen to the spirit say i am here with you face to face or far away god is present among us listen to your family say i am here with you as close as your breath your beating heart I am here with you as far as you go no matter the time I am here with you face to face or far away God is present among us listen to your 
community say I am here with you face to face or far away God is present among us listen to your neighbor say I am here with you as close as your breath your far as you go, no matter the time, I am here with you. As far as you go, no matter the time, I am here with you. Join with me in prayer, and as we pray, feel free to share your joys and your prayer concerns in the comments. Loving God, you are faithful and ever-present. You are holy and gracious and loving. We confess that we have not always appreciated your presence and your grace. We confess that we have been scared and we have been hesitant to make decisions not knowing what's going to happen, but we trust in your guidance and we trust in your goodness. Lord, in this moment, we lift up our joys, those things for which we are thankful. We are thankful for technology that allows students to be able to return to school uh, in a safe way right now. We are thankful for for doctors and nurses who continue to go to work despite the risks. We are thankful for a few minutes of rain that we had last week. And Lord, we pray for those things that we have coming up. We pray for all of the children returning to school this week and next week. We pray for parents who may be stressed out with scheduling that you help facilitate. We pray for teachers who are learning a new technology and who are balancing their own families and working. We pray for safety for all of our students. We pray for safety for those cleaning up after the train derailment in Tempe, especially with the heat. And Lord, we also pray for rain. As we come to the end of our monsoon season, we pray that we could get some more rain. And together, we all join together in the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This week, Becca will be continuing with our sermon series on compassion. And so please join us as we read from Ruth 1. Listen now for a word of the Lord. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there, but Elimelech the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Chilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. 
so she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you, or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, there will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the women said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Call me no longer Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has dealt harshly with me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned back together with Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, who came back with her from the country of Moab. They came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. I need my phone. Where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. That's probably the most famous past verse from this book of Ruth. And that verse in particular is often used during wedding ceremonies. And it's a beautiful idea. Where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. And in some ways, when two people become married, that is what they are doing and that is what they're committing to. But this story takes place during a lot of pain and tragedy. And so looking at the context, it seems sometimes an unusual choice for wedding ceremonies. But a wedding I officiated a few years ago, um, it felt very appropriate for this text. I was honored to officiate the wedding of Rob Repta and David Caro, who some of you know, Rob was a faithful member of our church, but has since, he and his husband have since relocated and now live in Minneapolis. And for their wedding, it was in Chicago, so I flew out there to officiate the wedding, and it was a beautiful ceremony. Rob was from our church, and David is Jewish, and so it was an interfaith um, marriage. And the reason that they selected Ruth was in some part to honor David's mother named Ruth, who was no longer living. So they knew that personal connection to loss, just as starts this story in Ruth. Rob's mother was also not there, and she was not there by choice um, and not accepting. And so in this beautiful ceremony, hearing this passage from Ruth felt so appropriate because there two of them coming together for this marriage 
had similarities to Ruth's story about people coming together from different backgrounds and different cultures and different faiths. After the ceremony was over and during the reception, I got to meet many of David's family members who were just so pleased and touched that Rob and David had um, selected this passage to remember and um, celebrate David's mother who was not there. Stories we tell are sometimes used for certain purposes. And there's a whole genre of stories that are stories told as correctives. They're used as tools for corrective. When my children were younger, when they were toddlers in childcare, again and again, I would come and pick them up at the end of my workday, and I'd be given the slip of piece of paper that told me they had bitten someone that day. And I was at a loss. I didn't want my children to be known as biters, and nothing I seemed to do seemed to curtail it. Time after time, they would, I'd come to pick them up, and they'd get this little note saying they had bit someone today. And so I wanted to bring today a book that became um, a common one in our house. Um, because when I would come home, I'd sit them down in my lap, and I'd read this book to them. Teeth are not for biting. And I was saddened to go through my bookcase and realize that I probably donated it a while ago, which is good news because they no longer have a reputation of biting. Um, but really, I'm not sure if I even donated it because it was so worn from all the times we had used it. And in my mind, I probably can quote it because I remember teeth are not for biting. Ow, that hurts. And then it would go on to different examples of why, how you should use your teeth. Um, so that book was definitely used as a, with the hope of being a corrective. This story, the story of Ruth, was written during a time period um, during the time of Nehemiah and Ezra. It is post-exile. The people of God had been in exile and now they are no longer, and they are trying to build up their kingdom once again. And as they are trying to do this, this idea of homage, homage, homogenization creeps in. And Ezra even writes and tries to um, encourage that we should kick out all of the foreign women and make sure our men do not marry foreign wives. We have to build back our kingdom as a people of God. But his voice was not the only voice. And instead, this book of Ruth was written as a corrective to that attitude. Ruth was the great-grandmother of David. And as Christians, Ruth shows up in Jesus' genealogy in the Gospel of Matthew. As Jesus is connected to David's line and Ruth is mentioned. As people of faith, we are encouraged to look at Ruth as this extraordinary example of loving kindness in extreme faithfulness. We are to go to the story of Ruth whenever we need a corrective to see how God is faithful and God works with a woman who is a Moabite, a foreigner. See, Ruth, she had three strikes against her. One, she's a woman. The other, she's Moabite, she's a foreigner. And the third, she's a widow. And so is her mother-in-law, Naomi. The story starts out in this reading that we just heard that Naomi and her husband had left Bethlehem during a famine, and they had come to Moabite and for hope, hoping that they could build a new life and be, have access to resources. Her sons marry Moabite women, but then tragedy strikes when her husband and her two sons die. And once again, she finds herself needing to travel to seek out some hope. So she decides to return to Bethlehem, 
but she realizes her daughter-in-laws would be better off staying in Moab as Moabite women remarrying there. She encourages them to leave, and Orpah does. Orpah kisses her goodbye and goes back home. But Ruth, Ruth clings to her mother-in-law and goes with her. Where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. The thing I love about this story is that a woman, a foreigner, a widow, is lifted up as an example of loving kindness, as faithfulness. The story of Ruth is unique in the Old Testament because God really doesn't play an active role, isn't a huge character in the book. Instead, we get glimpses of God through Ruth's character. And another thing I love about this is that this is a story about women. And too often, if you go peruse movies or books about where there's finally a lead woman, too often, though, the other women in the story are pitted against each other. And maybe we get an example of what a strong, faithful woman looks like, but often at the detriment of putting down another woman or seeing another woman as a villain. That doesn't happen here. We have Naomi and we have Orpah and Ruth, and we're not supposed to look at Ruth as the good example and Orpah as the bad example. They both made choices that were right for them. Women supporting women can have profound impact. We are living during a time during this Me Too movement Hashtag time's up. And back in 2017, after the Harvey Weinstein revelation, Alyssa Milano um, helped make the Me Too hashtag trendy. But she did so by amplifying another woman who had come before her, who had founded the Me Too movement a decade before, Tarana Burke. They worked together to amplify their voices to make an impact in women with women everywhere. If you continue to read through the book of Ruth, which I encourage you to do, you can easily do it this afternoon. It's just a few chapters long and it's a beautiful story. But in the next chapter or so, we'll learn about what happens to Naomi and Ruth when they go back to Bethlehem. And Ruth is gleaning in the fields as widows do for a sake of um, being able to survive. But while she is in that field, there is a verse that just stood out to me this year when I read it. And it was about how, um, I am blanking on the names, but I know I have two biblical scholars in the room. Who does Ruth marry? It's Boaz. Boaz. <laughs> Thank you. See, I'm not here by myself. <laughs> I just, I was con Boaz. So when she's gleaning in Boaz's field, Boaz comes to her and protects her and says, I'm going to make sure none of the men bother you in the field. And that's great, but it also pointed to the reality that women experience in the fields and how that is a story as old as time. Because women that are farm workers in fields to this day experience gender-based violence with high percentages. Four out of five women farm workers have reported that they have experienced gender-based violence by working in the fields. And we have people like Ruth who stand up and is a champion for what is right, who is an example of loving kindness, extreme faithfulness. There are women, especially foreign women, in our midst today that are examples just like Ruth. And one I want to um, introduce you to in case you don't know her, her name is Millie Trevino Saceda. She began as a farm worker at the young age of eight, when she, with her siblings and family in Idaho, would harvest potatoes. Later, when she became a teenager, her family moved to California, and they started working in the citrus fields. And she shares stories about 
As a teenager, she always made sure her brother was right next to her when she was harvesting the citrus because of the unsolicited and unwanted advances that the tractor driver, other supervisors in the field would give to her as a young teenager feeling vulnerable in the fields. But Millie is an activist now and an organizer and has been for a long time. And in 2017, during, after the Harvey Weinstein revelation and Hollywood actors were coming out to amplify the need to look at gender-based violence by using the hashtags MeToo and Time's Up, Millie's organization wrote an open letter written on behalf of 700,000 farm workers, women in our country, who say they all stand in solidarity with their Hollywood sisters. This is part of what they wrote. We do not work under bright stage lights or on the big screen. We work in the shadows of society, in isolated fields and in packing houses that are out of sight and out of mind for most people in this country. Your job feeds souls, fills hearts, and spreads joy. Our job nourishes the nation with the fruits, vegetables, and other crops that we plant, pick, and pack. Women organizing and coming together to amplify each other's voices. Gender-based violence has the situation where speaking up can always be risky. But the stakes are even higher with low-wage workers who are often without financial freedom and are less likely to access legal resources and live in fear of their immigration status. And women often depend on their male supervisors for employment, housing, and transportation. But Millie gathering women together and using their power of organizing has brought a light and the darkness. This morning, let us use Ruth's story as a corrective for all of us. Whenever we feel fear creeping into our story, as a person, as a family, a community, or as a nation, that voice that tells us that we should look out for ourselves, that we should fear the other, we should fear the foreigner, when we are fed lies about the need for our security comes at the risk of putting others down, may we use this story of Ruth, who is our ancestor through Jesus, as a corrective. Ruth is our shining example. Let us strive to be more like Ruth, embodying compassion along the way. Thanks be to God. The story of Ruth is one of my favorites, um, and I'm glad that Becca told this story this morning. I love this story because, well, let's face it, it's about love. The first love story is how Ruth chose to, to love her mother-in-law, Naomi, and followed her to, the, to her home in Bethlehem. Ruth left her country, Moab, and all of her family to go and live in a strange place with Naomi. She was a Gentile who was redeemed by her faith and loyalty. Ruth told Naomi, just as Becca read in the scriptures, that where she would go, 
where Naomi went, she would go with her and stay with her. And she told Naomi that her God would be Ruth's God. Now, the second love story is between Ruth and Boaz. Boaz was the kinsman and redeemer in the story. I think of him as being um, Ruth's knight in shining armor. He actually was related to Naomi. And through Naomi's help, Ruth and Boaz met and eventually the story goes they fell in love. So here was Ruth the foreigner from Moab who lived in an enemy land to her own country and she became the wife of Boaz, mother of Obed, grandmother of Jesse, and great-grandmother to the king of Israel, King David. She was one of only four women who are mentioned in Jesus's genealogy. The book of Ruth describes God's provision for those who choose to follow him. It is a story of redemption of Naomi as God's chosen faithful and of Ruth as a Gentile accepted by faith. The story of Ruth is for all of our generations. By our kinsman and redeemer, redeemer Jesus Christ, we are redeemed and made a part of the family of God. As we come to the Lord's table this morning, we can all participate because we remember that his great sacrifice was for us. We take the bread of life and drink the cup of salvation we remember and thank God for his mercy and grace. Please join with me as we share the Lord's Supper. And we remember that on the night he was betrayed, after giving thanks, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the meal, after giving thanks, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for you. Whenever you do this, do so in remembrance of me. And so as we join together in this meal with our siblings all across the world, we remember that we proclaim Christ's death until he returns. Would you pray with me, please? Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for this story of Ruth that reminds us that you are our kinsman redeemer, that your sacrifice made it possible for God's love and mercy to reach out to us so that we may be a part of the family of God. Help us to be a willing and active part of this family and that all we do and say may be to your glory. In your precious name we pray, amen.
worship forever. We'll worship forever and we'll worship forever, Lord. We'll worship forever. We'll worship forever. We'll worship forever, Lord. Lord. Over the past several weeks, we have been learning about compassion, how it is one of the basic tenets of Scripture, how it was the center of Jesus' work in life, and how we might become more compassionate. If you've been asking yourself, what can I do to be more compassionate, then have I got something for you. Through the work of Week of Compassion, one of the shared ministries of the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, you and I have already been doing the following. Coordinating with partners who are working to respond to the needs emerging from the coronavirus pandemic. Helping to relieve natural disasters such as tornadoes, earthquakes, hurricanes, flooding, and fires working with refugees and displaced people at home and around the world. These are just a few of the things that you have been doing through your financial support of Foothills Christian Church. You've heard it said before that we never pass an offering plate, but if you wish to give, you can send a text message, visit the church website, or mail in a check. Every dollar that you donate makes a difference. I am standing outside of our sanctuary because I have a couple of service announcements that I wanted to tell you about. Even though we are not meeting in person, Foothills is a community-oriented, service-oriented church, and I know that many of you have been missing being able to serve in the various ways. So I want to let you know that we still have service projects going on. So right behind me, you're going to see a basket, and I'm right by the sanctuary door. We will have another basket and some signs. We have two projects that we are collecting for. One is for the Islamic Community Center. They are collecting non-perishable food items that they distribute to the community. So if you have non-perishable food items, bring them over and put them in the basket. Another service opportunity that we just had come up is for group homes, who, which are COVID group homes. So these are homes for foster children who have been diagnosed with COVID. They are just opening up and these are kids who maybe were on the streets and are returning into foster care or were in the hospital for something else but had a positive test and they cannot be placed in normal foster homes or maybe they were in a normal foster home but for whatever reason they can't be there while they're sick. So these kids are spending a two week period in these homes and what I was told was that they often come with nothing except for the paper gown that they came from the hospital in. 
Um, these are kids from all the way from zero to 17, and so they need a lot of supplies. So what we're asking is if you have clothing that you can bring, uh, games, toys, school supplies, uh, things that are in good condition, and we will be dropping those off uh, within the next two weeks. If you could get that stuff to us, we'd really appreciate it. We also want to highlight that we are an inclusive church, and that includes gender diversity, sexual orientation diversity, and racial diversity. And so we do have our inclusive library here, and this is a free library. We encourage kids in the community and kids in the church to come and read the books. If you've been by Foothills lately, you've seen our rainbow flags all over uh, the church. Uh, somebody felt that they needed to cut down the one that was over on the main road. So we will have another one coming on Tuesday. So if you're driving by, look for that. We're very excited to be a light for inclusiveness in the community. And now, at, uh, one more announcement. We are taking a break from our Zoom fellowships for the next month. So for all of August, we're taking a break and look for that to resume in September. And now here a final blessing as we end our time together. May you be the church in the world. May you recognize those people who are the light of Christ, but who are on the margins and recognize that your responsibility is to bring them compassion and love, just as Ruth. And now, may the peace of God be with you. Amen.